with the slide that said the center had been definitely weakened um, with Meade's use of his interior lines, shifting, shifting his forces uh, back and forth. And um, Lee noticed this, and he was going to formulate his ideas for day three uh, on that premise. You see um, Daniel Sickles on the bottom. He is uh, the guy who pushed his third core out front there, way out front, and sort of derailed uh, Lee's plans and Longstreet's plans. Uh, Joshua Chamberlain, you see him on the right. He was uh, part of the defense of Little Round Top and became part of uh, a, a storied history. Uh, the Confederates on the left there, Yule, Longstreet, A.P. Hill. A.P. Hill, who has been sick pretty much through this entire campaign. Um, Hood on the bottom, of course. Hood uh, was wounded very severely on the second day and uh, it suffered a severe arm wound. And uh, Hancock up there to your right. Hancock, who was in charge of the second uh, Corps, uh, performed magnificently on the second day, and he will do so again on the third day. Now, why is there a clock right in the middle of the screen? Well, I put that there as a reminder because Robert E. Lee in his quote unquote invasion of the North, time was always against him. Months, days, hours and minutes. Every day, every hour and every minute he spent out of uh, Virginia was going to work against him because uh, the forces in Pennsylvania were gradually coming together. Um, General Darius Cooch, who was uh, uh, at the um, Battle of Chancellorsville with Hooker, he didn't like the way Hooker was doing things, uh, so he asked to be removed from his command there, but he was in charge of forces in Pennsylvania. Currently, during the Battle of Gettysburg, he's on the other side of the Susquehanna holding that line hoping that Lee would not be able to get across. But since all the forces were concentrating at Gettysburg, he is now going across the river to York, to Lancaster, and ready in case his forces are necessary at Gettysburg. The Eighth Corps, which really didn't take any part in the battle, they are moving from Harper's Ferry, southwest, southeast, sorry, uh, towards Frederick, and they are getting ready just in case they are needed. Lee did not have very many provisions other than foraging uh, in the Pennsylvania countryside. He had no firm supply lines going back into Maryland and Virginia. So eventually, had he stayed any longer, he would have been trapped. So here's a picture I wanted to show you. This is an excellent, beautiful map drawn after the battle by John Batchelder. Uh, and you can see the topography all the way up there on the right. Uh, those are the hills uh, by Chambersburg and it goes down, 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 down. And you see uh, the town of Gettysburg. And as you go over further to the left, you see big round top all the way over on the left and you see little round top. And you can see what Buford was talking about or Sam Elliott in that first uh, day about there being a huge bowl around um, Gettysburg and all of that wonderful high ground. In the distance, you can see Seminary Ridge closer uh, to the front of the screen. You can see Cemetery Ridge and why those were so important becomes very, very uh, relevant. Next, what's going to happen? Well, at the end of day two, Meade has his council of war and he takes all of these guys' opinions into account. Now we see a couple of new faces here, and that's because uh, the uh, actions that happened on the first and second day. Just to um, the left of your screen by me, we see General John Newton, who is now in charge of the first corps. Of course, we see Hancock further to the left, he's in the second. Underneath him is uh, General Burney. He takes over because Dan Sickles got his leg shot off. And uh, next to him, we have George Sykes, who is still in charge of the Fifth Corps, 
Next to him, we have General John Sedgwick in charge of the Sixth Corps. To the right of him, we see um, General Oliver Otis Howard uh, in charge of the 11th Corps. And above, we see General Slocum. Now, getting on uh, with the uh, conference, they decide that they are indeed going to stay because they have excellent position. That position has been improved over the nighttime. And as you can see, before we had the formation, it was sort of like a long, long, long line um, that's kind of stopped short of Little Round Top and was not quite hooked around on the top near Culp's Hill. Now you see it looks more like a shepherd's hook. Both of those flanks are now very, very secure uh, on the right with the 12th Corps and on the left, uh, anchored on Little Round Top. So what's the plan for July 3rd? We take a look at this, and again, this one you can see looks very, very um, different, again, from the second day. We see General Sedgwick firmly anchored with his 6th Corps on uh, the far left, we see the cavalry uh, under Kilpatrick also down there on the left, Slocum's 12th Corps um, up there on the right. And um, General Lee is now going to start formulating his plans for day three. And you're gonna hear a lot of different things maybe that you've never heard about before about this battle. Again, we know that Lee knows that Meade's center was very weakened on that second day. He also knows that because of that, those troops up on Culp's Hill, Meade, again, he was using his interior lines to great effect. He was shifting brigades back and forth. And in order to save um, the collapsing front in front of the Third Corps, he stripped brigades away from Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. And now, as I indicated, that looks like a shepherd's hook, a salient against which Lee decided he was going to launch a pincer attack from the east by Culp's Hill and from the west on Cemetery Ridge. And he was gonna snip the top of that salient right off. And hopefully he was going to get around and behind Meade's line and cut off their escape. He was still hoping for that big victory. So what happens? Even before Lee can formulate his plans completely, they were going to be thwarted because General Slocum, who sometimes suffers from a bad reputation of uh, being called General Slow come, in other words, that he doesn't always get somewhere quickly, he was right on the spot just before sunrise, a tremendous, tremendous federal cannonade starts hitting those Confederates that had lodged at the bottom of Culp's Hill. Lee decided, well, okay, we can't go there. And even though the Confederates do counterattack at Culp's Hill, um, Lee decides that he's still going to go ahead with his attack from the West. Now we see a funny German word on the bottom there called Schwerpunkt. In literal uh, translation, it means heavy point. This is a military tactic where you're going to concentrate all of your forces on one very small, limited space in hope of having a breakthrough. And this is what he was going to do, hopefully, to Meade Center. So anyway, fighting is erupting at Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill. And this is the uh, graphic that you see. You see good old Brigadier General uh, George Green up there still holding the line uh, by Culp's Hill. He was very instrumental in holding that area in the second day. Uh, General Geary, uh, and we see the first corps uh, that's still there under Wadsworth, and uh, a lot of the action that's taking place at uh, the lower part of Culp's Hill. Uh, the fighting there on Culp's Hill very early in the morning is going to go on for seven full hours, and this is one of the areas there you can see how the Rocky Hill uh, area down there on the right hand side. I also put that picture up there of the Maryland uh, Battalion. Now, remember Maryland was a neutral state um, or a border state. And 
they had troops fighting on both sides. And there were very, uh, there was a few times during the Civil War that the Maryland Federals and the Maryland Confederates fought each other. And this was one of them um, at that time. So what's going to happen now that Lee's morning plans have been thwarted, he's going to ride over and talk to General Longstreet about the third day. And he's going to say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to attack that center and we are going to use uh, Pickett's division. Pickett's division that had just arrived late on the second day of July. So those troops are fresh. Um, he also tells Longstreet that he's to use General Heath's and General Pender's division. Um, but there's a problem with that because General Heath and General Pender were both wounded uh, in battle earlier. So he's going to pass along uh, the commands of those two uh, divisions to uh, General Brigadier General Pettigrew and General um, Trimble, who is sort of a supernumerary uh, general. He doesn't really have a, any particular command. Uh, and Lee is going to uh, assign some of those brigades to him. You see Trimble up in the right-hand corner, and you see General uh, Pettigrew on the bottom from North Carolina. And uh, this is the plan for July 3rd. As you can see, Yule uh, has already uh, be, been engaged, as I said, for seven hours very early, early in the morning. Now, this is the preliminary setup of what's going to happen. You're going to see Pettigrew's division and Pickett's division in the center. Is Pickett's, uh, Pettigrew on the top part of Cem Cemetery Ridge did not have as far to go. Um, Pickett was going to be in the center, and there were going to be two brigades um, on um, Pickett's right hand flank to uh, lend support um, if it was needed. So we're going to go forward here. And here is George Pickett, okay? George Pickett, of course, is known uh, for the, the charge that is about to take place. Um, even though Pickett's division only had three brigades uh, in this uh, attack, the uh, divisions under A.P. Hill who would be commanded by overall uh, General Longstreet uh, at this time. Uh, Pickett actually had fewer brigades. Pickett was a very interesting guy. He uh, was at the first battle of Bull Run. He was in for seven days. He was wounded at Gaines Mill um, in, during that peninsula campaign. And he uh, had to take time to recover. He was not there in time for uh, Antietam. He was not there in time for Fredericksburg and uh, he missed Chancellorsville as well. So he has, uh, he's coming back and he's going to be in command of his division. Longstreet always liked him um, a lot. So he is uh, going to be in that center uh, section. Here we have, oops, sorry. Here we have uh, Pickett's division. Uh, Pickett's division will be composed of Armistead's brigade, um, in the center, we have uh, James Kemper. And on the right, we have Richard Brooke Garnett. Now, each one of these guys have a very particular story to tell. On the left, we have uh, Lewis Addison Armistead. He had a very interesting career at West Point. And uh, one of the famous stories is that he got into a lot of trouble one time because he broke a plate over Jubal Early's head and uh, they asked him to leave. But he uh, joined the regular army and uh, he served out West. And uh, there is a lot of talk about his friendship that he, that he had with uh, Winfield Scott Hancock. They most definitely did. And when the war came and each one of these guys were deciding which side they were going to fight on, um, Armistead, uh, who's from Virginia, decided same way that Lee did that he was not going to raise his sword against his home state. He took Hancock uh, by the hand and he said, you do not know what this has cost me. And they went their separate ways. James Kemper in the center, a uh, Virginia politician, um, not really a military man, but when he was in command of troops, he performed very well. Um, after the war, he is going to become governor of uh, Virginia. Then we had Richard Brooke Garnett on the right. Uh, 
Poor, poor uh, Garnett is an extremely tragic figure. Uh, in his early uh, time in the um, Shenandoah Valley, the first battle of Kernstown, which took place in March 1862, he's in charge of the Stonewall Brigade because Stonewall Jackson is in charge uh, of the entire army there. Uh, the Stonewall Brigade starts running out of ammunition. Garnett orders a withdrawal and a retreat. This he did without permission from Jackson. Jackson immediately puts him under arrest and is going to court martial him. However, events uh, intervene, that is uh, the war, and Robert E. Lee eventually um, dismisses these charges, but this is always a stigma that Garnett is going to have. So the troops are moving around into position and Longstreet, uh, again, he is asking Lee, he said, we don't really need to make this attack. We don't want to make this attack. I don't think it's going to work. And there's a lot of dialogue between the two of them where Longstreet's saying, I've been a soldier all my life and I don't see how any 15,000 men can take the position, which is almost between a half a mile and three quarters of a mile over open country. And here is Longstreet. He's talking to um, Colonel Edward Porter Alexander, and he is in charge, uh, has been placed in charge of the uh, artillery at this point. What Lee is going to do and what he said, again, it's in the French version of the German word, Schwerpunkt, a fou den fa. In other words, a blazing amount of fire being placed on one central section of the enemy line. So what's going to happen is they have 170 cannons starting a bombardment at precisely 107. And uh, the thunder from these guns, a lot of uh, the reports that came in, uh, they could hear the cannons firing from uh, Lancaster from York. There's even some that say they can hear them in Pittsburgh, although I don't know if that's entirely uh, true, uh, offering uh, the excuse for acoustic skip, perhaps, uh, that was known to happen. But anyway, the cannons open up about 107, and they are firing all the way along that central line. And what happens immediately is what exactly Alexander thought, is that once those cannons are firing, all of those cannons, there's going to be an enormous amount of smoke and haze, and they're not going to be able to direct fire after a few minutes. They can't see where those shells are going. And every time one of those cannons down on the left, you see it bucks backward and its trail digs in a little more. And what that means is that those shots are flying over and what happens, the unintentional effect, the Union troops at that stone wall on, um, by the cups of trees, they are all lying down flat. They are all prone. They are behind that stone wall. So many of these shells are just flying harmlessly over them. However, because they are being shot over, they are landing in the artillery park and the caissons and the limbers with all of that artillery uh, in the back of the Union line. Also, as soon as that uh, barrage, that bombardment started happening, a lot, some of the Union troops decided, hey, that's it for me, I'm out of here. And they start running. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of those Confederate shells that are flying over, they burst among them and cause casualties. Now on the other side, the Union, they start firing back. About 15 minutes later, they start firing. Their shells are, fall, are falling almost right in the middle of those troops, those brigades that are forming up for the attack. Now, what also is happening um, up on Little Round Top, there is a much better view, and Warren is up there still with his signal corps. And then, precisely at two o'clock, the troops start moving. And again, up there on Little Round Top, Warren sees this. They start waving the flags. And even through uh, the smoke, they can see up there on Seminary Ridge, they can see the troops that are coming out. And they said, there 
coming. Now, what was going to happen? Well, almost immediately, things start happening. Um, the division under Pettigrew, as I said before, they are in sort of in the top part there. But there's almost a 400-yard gap between Pettigrew's right flank and Pickett's left flank. And what they have to do is almost uncanny and unreal what they were doing. Pickett had to do what they called a left oblique. And almost as soon as they're out, the Confederate or the uh, Union cannons, which had fallen silent for a while, and this is what made the Confederates think that, yes, aha, they had knocked out all of those federal cannons. That's they're coming out, and then the uh, Union cannons start firing again, and almost immediately, huge holes are being ripped in the, those lines. And Pickett has to do the left oblique to try to close that gap. And because there's fire also coming from Cemetery Hill, Union artillery up there, and the Union artillery and the little round top, they are compressing those lines. So Pettigrew starts moving to the right. Pickett is obliquing to the left to try to close that gap. Now, what happens eventually is that those two come together and a lot of those troops are starting to bunch up. So here we are, this is just about 3.30 and you see the lines are getting a lot closer. Again, um, they, they are being hit with solid shot and as they get closer, the Union cannons are going to switch over to canister. Now, as you know what canister is, those are shells that are full of a lot of um, smaller balls large and um, some larger ones as well, but it's designed to be uh, able to just wipe out whole sections of the line. And that's exactly what was happening. So Armistead's brigade is behind uh, Kemper's and Garnett's brigade. He's coming up from behind on the, uh, again, on the uh, left of the Confederate line. You see those um, brigades that are coming through and as they get closer, they have to get to the Emmitsburg Road. And as you can see the Emmitsburg Road in the middle there, um, when they get there, they have two fences that they have to get through. There's a fence on the west side of Emmitsburg Road and there's a fence on the right side of Emmitsburg Road. They have to either climb over or tear down this fence. And up to this point, the Confederates are not even shooting. They are just marching and they are dressing their line as they go along. And the Union troops that are looking at this in disbelief, they can't believe that these troops are just marching almost in parade ground fashion. So here we get closer uh, to about 3.30 and uh, Pickett has done his complete left oblique as you can see and uh, Pettigrew's uh, brigades Trimble's brigades, uh, poor General Trimble is going to be hit in the leg with an explosive bullet. His leg is eventually going to be amputated. But as you can see, there's Pickett's division and they are, uh, have done their left oblique. Now, as they're doing that, also, again, I'm telling you that the Union cannons up on Little Round Top are having a field day because they are doing what's called enfilading fire. They're firing down that entire line as Pickett is moving to the left. And um, Kemper, he falls, he is hit um, uh, in, in the abdomen. He takes a, a hit there. And poor Garnett, what happens with him? Uh, he has been sick. He's got a fever um, of some sort, but uh, he is actually riding a horse. And of course the horse He's riding a horse, he becomes a perfect target. He is shot and killed, knocked off his horse. He dies almost instantly when he hits the ground. He, in some ways, this is how he felt that he was atoning for his mistake that he made at Kernstown. Now in this picture, you see in the sort of the center left, you see um, General Winfield Scott Hancock. He also was on horseback. He's riding up and down the line very calmly telling these troops while they were prone 
He's telling them, don't worry, we're going to be fine, we're going to take care of this. And they're looking up at him in actual disbelief. They can't believe he's doing that. And what happens is a piece of shell hits his saddle and a uh, nail from that saddle pierces his thigh. He gets a very, very serious wound. And this is what you're going to see from the other side. This is what I know this is a modern uh, view of this. But this is what the Confederates are all converging on. This is the copse of trees. Now, of course, this set of trees was not there during the war, but there was that set of trees. Now, that's going to become very important because that stone wall is at an angle right there. Now, at this point, after the Confederates are over that Emmitsburg Road and they're going up that slope towards that copse of trees, of course, the Union troops raise and they fire countless volleys into uh, the Confederates. And again, Garnett's brigade, Kemper's brigade are almost completely wiped out and Armistead's brigade is behind them. He is then going to make it closest to um, that co co copse of trees. We have several paintings that we're going to look at. And this is one of the more famous ones. Uh, this is Armistead. He takes off his hat. He shoves his sword through the hat and he's holding his sword and his hat so everybody can center on him. And they are getting closer there. As you can see, they're getting close right up to that line. These are the Confederates that made it closest to that. Members of Armistead's brigade, they actually get over that wall. There's Armistead right there. He's coming close to that cannon and he gets there and he is then shot. And at this point, there's so few of those Confederate soldiers, they're uh, either being shot dead right in front of them by a point blank range. There's hand-to-hand -hand combat, muskets, rifled muskets being used as clubs. And uh, so many of those men right there are going to be captured and um, they're going to be uh, sent as the Union Army retreats. Okay, this is four o'clock right here. You can see all those little speckles. Those are the brigades that have been completely almost wiped out. The Vermonters under Stannard on the right, they launched a, uh, a flank attack against uh, Pickett's uh, brigades, um, completely uh, destroying some of the, uh, the regiments. These are the guys that are then fleeing back so many of them decided they didn't want to flee. They just walked over the uh, ridge. Uh, they walked over that stone wall and surrendered right then and there. Here's one of the more famous pictures of uh, Pickett's charge. This is uh, part of the uh, Gettysburg Cyclorama, which, you'll, uh, which you can see when you go there to visit. This is uh, a famous picture of Armistead where, they, where he and his uh, brigade, all Virginians, uh, they make it to uh, that stone wall and over the wall. And again, right there, that is when it is stopped. And we want to talk just very briefly, we'll see a couple of slides later, um, about why this is called Pickett's Charge. And I think this comes into play right here. It's because Armistead's Brigade made it the furthest. And of course, Armistead's Brigade was part of Pickett's division. They made it the furthest they are then considered the high water mark of the Confederacy. Now, what happens is many of those troops, they are coming back uh, and they finally make it to the line. And this is where they are met by Robert E. Lee. And he tells them, I'm so, so sorry. This was all my fault. And they're saying, no, 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 no. But he's saying, this was all my fault. I take complete responsibility for this. Uh, but then again, over uh, at the angle at the stone wall, there's two people that have been uh, severely wounded. And I know you know this, these scenes from the movie. Uh, this is uh, Hancock and Armistead are both wounded. Again, as I said, um, Hancock is wounded in the thigh. He actually pulls that nail out of his thigh, but then they put a tourniquet on him uh, to try to save his life. Armistead is not going to be so lucky. He is the one, he does not die immediately from his wounds. He is uh, carried back and uh, he dies about a day or two later. 
and a kind of a, a sad thing about this picture that you see of the actor uh, Richard Jordan, he would indeed can himself die a few months after filming um, the movie. Now, one of the interesting things about Armistead, uh, I have a rubbing that I did of him, of his um, gravestone that is in central Baltimore, believe it or not, of all places. Uh, the Armisteads, uh, his, of course, his uncle, was uh, in charge at Fort McHenry, Star Spangled Banner and all of that. And he is buried right next to his uncle at the old St. Paul Cemetery in uh, downtown Baltimore. And how he got there is that the uh, Maryland Armisteads and the Virginia Armisteads uh, came to the decision that that is where um, he would be buried. But at Gettysburg, this is uh, the uh, monument to him. Not quite exactly where he fell, but that was pretty much uh, uh, just about where they thought it was. Now, as far as Pickett's charge is concerned, the number of soldiers engaged, the Union only had 6,500. Of course, they're on the defensive. They're behind the stone wall. They've got that artillery and the Confederates, about 15,000. The casualties, again, the Union, they're in defense, about 1,500 the Confederates about 6,000. Now, what about George Pickett? What happened with his division? He had about 6,000. He suffered about 50% casualties. All three of his brigade commanders were killed or wounded. All of his 15 regimental commanders were killed or wounded. This was a devastating um, attack, which everybody pretty much in the beginning knew was not going to succeed. We're going back to Armistead for just a second. This is a beautiful monument uh, that you'll see at uh, Gettysburg. It's a friend of friend monument. That is Lewis Armistead laying down. And uh, Captain Henry Bingham, uh, who was on the staff of the second uh, Corps of uh, Hancock. Now I know in the movie it showed Tom Chamberlain doing this, but it wasn't Tom Chamberlain, it was Henry Bingham. And they're not really sure if there's any kind of Masonic back and forth, but what um, he asked him, he gave him his personal items that he had and asked them if he would give them uh, to Hancock. Now we, we need to have uh, just one human interest story. Uh, a lot of uh, you who have visited Gettysburg, part of that is uh, visiting the Jenny Wade house. And you know about Wesley Culp, um, interesting story there. Jenny Wade was killed on the third day of the battle. Uh, a bullet uh, pierced her side when she was baking bread in her house. Uh, Wesley Culp uh, was a resident of um, Gettysburg. He went south and he joined the 2nd Virginia Infantry, part of the Stonewall Brigade. But who's this guy in the center, Jack Skelly? That's part of the story that you almost never hear. Now, all three of these people knew each other um, before the war. And what had happened is during the Battle of Winchester, uh, just before the Battle of Gettysburg, Jack Skelly, who was in a Union um, regiment, is wounded and he's in a Winchester hospital. Wesley Culp, for some reason, uh, happens to go through there and because he knew him, he stopped and he said, well, sorry, Jack, what's going on? And Jack Scully says, I have some letters here I'd like you to give to Jenny because he and Jenny were uh, engaged to be married. Wesley Culp puts those letters in his pocket. They are then journeying up to Gettysburg. And I think you know the rest of the story. Wesley Culp is killed almost in sight of his uncle's farm and he never gets to deliver those letters. Here is the probably the most visited uh, other than the Pennsylvania Monument on the other side. This is the Lee Memorial uh, that is on um, Seminary Ridge. He is looking out over that long three quarters of a mile field of um, where Pickett's charge took place. Now, one other thing, again, this is a part that uh, is either glossed over or not really talked about very much. But during this time, there's a cavalry battle going on on the east side off of the Baltimore Pike. Jeb Stewart, who is desperately trying to atone for his absence, uh, launches an attack against uh, Union uh, cavalry that are there. There's back and forth. 
and I think you know who the guy is down on the right hand side. He's leading Michigan cavalry uh, in the uh, attack, as you can see, the Michiganders uh, on the right and the 7th Michigan, that is Custer. They are launching attacks back and forth. Uh, not really very conclusive, uh, a couple hundred casualties on each side. But again, um, Lee's hope of cutting off the, uh, the Federals from going back down towards Washington is thwarted. That road is still open. Now, we wanted to talk very briefly again about Pickett's Charge. This is at what's called the high water mark. Now, we see this, and as you see up in that top part, you see the repulse of Longstreet's assault. Now, it's called Longstreet's assault because Lee placed him in charge of that. And as I said, Pickett had three brigades. He didn't have the most amount of brigades, but because um, Longstreet placed him, uh, in charge, and again, he had the brigade that made it the furthest against the Union line. So it is forever after considered to be Pickett's charge. So after the war, very interesting. Again, as you know, this scene from there, when Lee rides over and he tells Pickett to reform his division because there's going to be a possible Union attack, Lee, uh, Pickett looks up at him and he says, General, I have no division. Well, he still actually had some, but they were absolutely in no condition to uh, fight whatsoever. But after the war, John Singleton Mosby, who is known as Mosby's Raiders, um, he uh, was present for a meeting between Pickett and Lee, and he had said that they were very cold. Uh, it was very a chill, chilly meeting. Uh, but that wasn't that that's hearsay and it's very possible uh, that 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 really didn't happen and he said that man destroyed my uh, division and most be was supposed to say to him yes but lee is who made you immortal now most historians they're not really sure they think that it was probably unlikely but what was true is that after the war um, when anybody would ask pickett about that, uh, he would say, yeah, I think the Yankees had something to do with that. Now we see the data on the left-hand side, Pickett lived only to be 50 years old, and his wife lived, Sally, who was always his champion, lived almost 50 years after his death. So July 4th, the sun's going down on the third day of the battle, and tomorrow would be July 4th. Vicksburg has fallen, and the skies are going to open up with a driving rainstorm. Both of the armies are still facing each other. Both are still um, anticipating an attack from each other. Meade opts to not attack Lee, even though he's pretty sure that Lee has been weakened. Now, why did he do this? On the bottom, I put some examples of why. During the big Confederate bombardment, they were using mostly shells that you see in the middle, solid shot. What they had in abundance still was all of their canister. The Union had used up most of their canister and their artillery uh, thwarting the Confederate attack. But the Confederates, who were kind of low on ammunition anyway, but still had enormous amount of their canister shot, they would have been able to do the same thing um, to the Yankees in reverse had they attacked. Lee decides on July 5th that he's had enough and he's going to leave because he needs to see to his 13,000 wounded soldiers. And this is the route they're going to take. Uh, he sends his wounded and his wagon trains up through Cashtown, uh, going up to Greenwood and then is going to come down. His troops gradually move off and they are going to go down. Lee or Meade does not follow immediately. He follows in a little while, and then they meet at Williamsport and have a short battle there, uh, otherwise known as Falling Waters. And uh, as you can see, there's casualties there. There, uh, Brigadier General James Pettigrew had suffered a small hand wound at Gettysburg. He is killed there. But guess what? Lincoln is extremely furious now at Meade, regardless of the fact that Meade, who has always been an underrated general and performed brilliantly in this battle, 
Lincoln says, he, Lee, was within your grasp and to have closed upon him, you could have ended the war. In other words, me, you blew it because you didn't uh, follow up on this victory. Now, what happened again at Williamsport, Lee's back was up against the uh, Potomac River, almost the way it was up against the river in Antietam. Uh, he was waiting for that river to go down. He stayed long enough until the Confederates could cross. They did that on July 14th and they were back in Virginia. So let's talk a few about the few salient points. You see what I did there? Salient, Danny, salient. Um, about the Battle of Gettysburg. Was it really an invasion? Well, an invasion is meant to hold and conquer a territory. Lee never had any chance of doing that because he brought limited sources. Again, as we indicated, he had no uh, supplies, no reinforcements coming up afterwards. The shadow of Jackson, we can't really uh, under, uh, I, we can't underemphasize this. The shadow of Jackson hovered over this entire battle. Let's be honest about that. Richard Ewell, great division commander, ended up being a terrible corps commander. A.P. Hill, he was sick the entire time, uh, various ailments, dysentery, um, and, and various things. So he was not really very effective in uh, giving his brigade commanders and uh, any kind of real orders. Yule was basically the same thing. He was indifferent at the end of the first day. So not much could be expected from him. Now, did Sickles on the second day, did he do the right thing? Well, you know what? I'm not even going to touch that one because there's uh, people on both sides of that issue. The illness of Hills, I said, Stewart's absent. Eh. Lee was kind of blind, but he still had cavalry that he could have sent out to um, get information, basically a uh, general inbo. The timing of Lee's movements, now that is very, very important in this entire battle. His timing was all off. Now we don't know, uh, we're gonna skip down a couple. Was Lee sick? There's those who think that Lee may have had a heart attack in the month of March and he was severely weakened. Um, his pride, well, there's that because Lee, was winning every battle up to that point. He had extreme, extreme confidence in his troops. And of course the troops, all of them performed brilliantly, but he was basically expecting them to do the impossible. Reynolds, we know Reynolds pretty much saved the day on the first day of the battle that he is killed. Hancock the superb, of course, that's a, 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 a word that he got uh, absolutely, we can't, really say enough about Hancock. He performed wonderfully on the second day, wonderfully on the third day. Joshua Chamberlain, who my wife chronicled beautifully in the last episode, Joshua Chamberlain, through his heroism, he secured basically the left flank for the Union. And then at the very bottom, we have the picket disaster, which we covered uh, pretty much in detail. One other human interest thing I wanna throw in there, Again, when I said at the top of this whole series, I've been to Gettysburg dozens and dozens of times as a, as a boy and as an adult. And every time I go, I learn something new. And this is one of the things, one of the interesting things. And as my wife Holly said the last time, uh, up on Little Round Top, Patty O'Rourke statue, people go up and they rub his nose for good luck. This is another interesting uh, uh, monument on the battlefield, the 11th Pennsylvania Infantry. And I'm a little proud of that because part of that uh, uh, regiment was raised in my part of the state. The regiment lost 15 killed and 59 wounded uh, during the fighting, but they had with him their bull terrier, um, Sally. Sally, um, at the end of the first day, of course, the 11th Pennsylvania got beat up really badly. She went out on the battlefield and the, the regiment didn't know where she had gone. She had laid down where uh, the soldiers were wounded or died. And they did not find her for several days until July the 4th, she was practically dead. Then they got her back into uh, some health. And then um, they took her uh, and she was in all the other battles until uh, she was killed at the Battle of Hatcher's Run. And they memorialized her at the, the Gettysburg um, 
monument there. Now that's rather clean right there that you see, but most of the time when you go there, there's dog bones that people have put there. Uh, there's different types of dog things, uh, pennies, uh, flowers, all kinds of stuff. Okay, so we're just about ready to wrap this up, but I'm gonna give you a little teaser here. We've talked about Hancock a lot, Winfield Scott Hancock in charge of the second Corps. Now, Hancock has a Fort Myers connection. And I'm not gonna tell you what that is, but I will tell you what that is on May the 28th when we talk about the battle of Fort Myers. And that's gonna be another story. But what I'm gonna leave you with is this. William Faulkner wrote about the Battle of Gettysburg. And he said that famous quote across the top, for every Southern boy 14 years old, not once, but whenever he wants it, there's the instance that it's always gonna be one o'clock on that July afternoon. The brigades are all in position. It hasn't happened yet. They don't know if it's going to happen. And then about the unbelievable victory that they had within their grasp, and the cast that was made two years ago. And you see our two soldiers, Johnny on the left, Billy on the right. And what you see in that center, that is a reunion photograph from 1938. That is a Confederate soldier and a Union soldier shaking hands. And that is true unity. That is true healing right there. And that is where we're going to end our program for today. And the sun goes down at the end of this day and at the end of this battle. Thank you.